little series on sorrow was prompted by our study of the end of the life of Judas. Uh, and if you imagine Judas heading out of Jerusalem on his way to his end, there are many words that we could use to describe him in that moment. We've talked about some of them. But for our purposes as we start this morning, the one word I'd like us to consider is the word alone. He was despairing alone. And he died alone. And our desire should be that no one around us who is sorrowing, no one who is despairing, would have to walk that journey alone. Now ultimately it is Jesus who says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And so no follower of Christ is actually ever alone. But don't we want to be a little reflection of Jesus and be there for those who are in sorrow and in despair? So I want to speak to you this morning about loving the despairing. If you missed either of the last two messages, I encourage you to go listen to them, though I know that we didn't get the audio or video up from last Sunday this week. We should get both last Sunday and this Sunday up this week for you if you missed last week's. And then actually there's going to be a fourth sermon in this series that keeps growing. Um, but I don't preach the Sunday after that, so it'll, it'll have to end next Sunday. Let's stop and pray. Father, we are full of confidence just because of you, not because of us. You are good and you are kind and you love us, and we're so grateful just that our, our hearts can be at peace in you today. Uh, but we also recognize that there may be some here this morning who's, who are really despairing and really low, or some here this morning that have family or friends that are in deep sorrow, and you have called us to help and to love, and we need your help to think about how you handle us and to know how to be like our Heavenly Father in how we reach out and love those who are despairing. So we come to you this morning and pray that you might be the God who triumphs over our pride and our selfishness and our ignorance and our foolishness and instead, uh, by your great shepherding, make us wise, tender, caring, courageous people in love for others. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. We want to be a little reflection of Jesus and be there for those who are in sorrow and despair. We would all agree to that, that that is our desire, yet it's hard. And in practice, we often don't know what to say or don't know what to do and sometimes even shy away from those who are in the deepest despair simply because it's so uncertain. And so this morning, I hope that God might spark in us fresh courage to love those who are despairing because I think the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak oftentimes. Now, there are some, maybe some here this morning who are the despairing ones. You're the ones who need the love and I hope there'll be some encouragement for you. Um, so I, actually the way I've written this, I realize, I, I hope I don't confuse you because I switch, I, I, I switch back and forth between speaking to those who are loving the despairing and speaking to the despairing. And so you'll have to try to keep track of which way I've, I'm headed at any given moment. Uh, but I hope to be helpful for both. But next Sunday, uh, so, so, so this message focuses on, on getting involved in the lives of those who are already experiencing sorrow upon sorrow. Okay? Next Sunday, I'm going to step back a step from that and talk more generally about how our everyday involvement in the lives of one another can really help keep us from spiraling into sorrow and, and despair. We just read from Job 6. Job's an intriguing example, of course, because he had friends who were with him in his despair, didn't he? They just were more of a problem than a help. And so I want us to focus on verse 14. For the despairing man, there should be kindness from his friend so that he does not forsake the fear of the Almighty. Now, it's a, it's a hard verse to translate because there are two clear parts to the verse and there's not a clear grammatical connection to tell us how the two parts fit together. So if you're reading something other than the New American Standard, um, it might have read a little bit differently from what I just read to you. But the two parts of the verse are, are clear, two main ideas. First of all, despairing people should not be left alone. They need friends. They need friends who are kind. Really simple, but really profound, isn't it? Judas was alone. 
And the second phrase then indicates that the danger in despair is that we will forsake the fear of the Almighty. And remember again that the fear of God is big biblical thinking about God. It is thinking about God as he really is. And so the danger in despair is that we will stop thinking about God as he really is. And we're going to come back to that uh, next Sunday. But you might want to just write that down for now. It's so foundational. When we are despairing, the greatest danger is that we'll stop thinking correctly about God. When we are despairing or sorrowing, our minds can really seem like our greatest enemies. They run to thoughts we didn't want to have. They process the same thoughts over and over again. Our minds can misperceive things, misinterpret things, believe false things. And so despairing people need kind friends who can help us think correctly, keep thinking correctly about God. Okay, so the, the two ideas in that verse really form the outline for the two messages this Sunday and next Sunday. This Sunday, I want to focus on the friends who care for those in sorrow or in despair. Next Sunday, I want to focus on the renewing of our minds, the daily need for right thinking, and the role we play in helping one another with that. All right, so despairing people need kind friends. They should not be left alone. We could even, I think, use the word caregiver. We often think of caregivers um, for the elderly, for people with terminal diseases, for people with serious disabilities. But many times, family and friends, church family, end up being like caregivers for people who are deeply sorrowing or despairing. And it's not easy. Even all the secular literature about depression agrees that depressed people are not very pleasant company. They're often hard to be around. And and they usually know that, too, that they're not very much fun to be around. It can seem like nothing you say or do helps them. They may seem very, very passive, or uninterested or or skeptical about anything we say. Um, Despairing people rarely say, oh, thank you so much for taking the time to be with me. Thank you so much for sharing truth and helping me with my thinking. That was great. It's not that they don't want to say that. It's just that their sorrow has them so weighed down that they're just really not even capable of saying something like that. And so it's difficult. Being a friend for a despairing person is not necessarily always rewarding in the short term, but God tells us that it is immensely valuable. Despairing people need kind friends. Now, why is it important for a despairing person to have kind friends? I mean, just practically, what difference can we make? And I just want to work through a whole bunch of practical thoughts with you about the value of loving the despairing. And I hope that through this, you'll feel courage and even excitement uh, about it. I'm not going to take us to a bunch of texts here. That would take us way too long, but I think all I'm going to say is built on a foundation of who God is and who we are in Scripture. So first of all, what difference can can a person who cares for a despairing person make? There are, first of all, there are many experts in society to help such people. Psychiatrists, psychologists, counselors, they consult, they have an appointment, and they move on. And in a church family, as we care for one another, we have the opportunity to keep at it day after day for the long term. And isn't that exactly what God told us we need? He said, and I'm I'm putting together Hebrews 3.13 and Hebrews 10.25. He said, don't forsake getting together, but encourage each other daily. Or to put that in just simple modern English, God said, get together for daily encouragement. Isn't that cool? That's what you need. God said, don't forsake getting together for daily encouragement. That's what we need in our sorrows, and that's what can happen as we love each other in the church. Don't underestimate the importance of just being there for someone. You might tell someone when you don't know anything else to say. You may tell them, I'm here. (laughs) I'm here. I'm going to walk through this with you. I'm going to love you no matter what and they might not respond to that. Again, don't expect them to say, oh, thank you so much. They may not have the capacity to say that or think that. Yet it still makes a difference. And oftentimes they'll come back and they'll say, thank you so much for being there with me. It was strengthening me even when I didn't know it, that you were there. 
God tells us that despairing people need kind friends, so stick with it. Your presence reminds them that Jesus is always with them. You, you can't always be with them like he can, but your presence reminds them that he is. Your presence reminds them that they're part of the family of Christ and that their family is there for them. So be there. As you stick with them, you really form a kind of partnership with that person. You and them together form a team. And they really need some people on their team in this. As a teammate, you're going to stick with them through ups and downs, through, to use the team metaphor, winning streaks and losing streaks. You know there isn't a quick, easy fix. You know God has placed you and them on a journey together for his glory, and it may be a hard path, but you're going to stick with them. You're not going to come into the situation saying, okay, you got a problem, I'm good at fixing problems, let me fix your problem, and then I'll get on to the next person so I can fix their problem. You're not going to think that way, right? You come in as on their team, to join them on that journey. As their teammate, you encourage them that there's a goal. This team matters. Their life matters in God's plans and purposes. You say that to them. Your life matters because of God and his purposes. Even in the midst of deep sorrow and despair, their life has purpose. And so they need a teammate to remind them of that. It's like a team it's like a team that's been a, a just perennial losers. And one of the things sometimes those teams will do is bring in someone who's played on a championship team, an older veteran to be on that team, to say to these young players, listen, I know we're losing a lot and it just seems like a lot of hard work right now, but I can tell you it's worth it. We're headed somewhere, right? And you can do that with a sorrowing person. You can also provide a, a boost for their hope. I read a f- tremendous book this week that I highly recommend to you. I've heard about this book for many years. It's in its second version now, but I didn't read it until this week, which was idiocy of me. It's called Depression, Looking Up from the Stubborn Darkness. Um, That's the title of the second uh, version of it. Depression, Looking Up from the Stubborn Darkness. It's by Ed Welch, and it is fantastic. Um, One of the things, and I'll, I'll, I'll say several things from that book this morning, but One of the things he points out is that when we're really low and feeling without hope ourselves, we can actually ride on someone else's hope. When you don't feel like you have any faith or any perseverance left, it's almost as if your kite can catch an updraft from someone else's faith and perseverance. One person who went through a period of of really dark depression said later that one of the things that helped her the most was, quote, a friend who let me borrow her faith. My faith was so weak, but I always knew that she was confident of God's presence and love. Your teammates. And even though you might not be as low as they are right now, you still need the same things they need. You need faith and you need love and you need hope and you need perseverance. And as God works in your heart about those things, you share some of those things with them and it's like fresh wind in your sails. As a matter of fact, simply sharing some of what God is doing in your heart is one of the simplest things you can do to encourage a person who is really low. You may be trying to think of things you can say to help them, and it may seem like nothing you're saying is helping. But if you just share how God might be helping your faith, your hope, your perseverance, your joy, that may well be what God uses to help them. As their teammate, you can also help them see things they might not be able to see themselves. More than anything else, you might be able to help them once again catch some glimpses of the glory of God. In depression, and by the way, I'm not, I'm not, there's a whole discussion we could have about the word depression. Um, It is both a helpful word and an unhelpful word, and there's a whole myriad of things we could say there. I'm just kind of using it interchangeably with sorrow and despair. Um, Uh, try not to be too technical. I think we know what we're talking about, hopefully. Um, One of the basic characteristics of depression is that your thinking shrinks down to primarily just be about you. And we need kind friends to pick up our eyes again to the big, awesome character of God and his fantastic purposes and our role in God's purposes. You may be able to help them see some things they're struggling to see. 
And not just that, not just seeing grand views of the majesty of God, but you might also be able to help them with little, little practical daily steps. Another basic characteristic of depression is that you stop feeling like doing anything. And when you don't feel like doing anything, you stop doing what you don't feel like, you know. And so you stop doing many of the things that you may have enjoyed before or been a normal part of your life before. And that's just one of the, if you go look at the, you know, DSM manual that supposedly defines depression for us. That's one of the uh, key characteristics that if you have five of them for more than two weeks, they're going to say you're having a major depressive episode, right? You stop wanting to do things. That's all there is to it because you don't feel like it. And so everybody agrees. Again, it's not just the Bible, but secular literature too agrees that part of recovery involves getting back to doing some of those things again, but you don't feel like it. (laughs) And that's where a teammate can really help. Somebody can come alongside and say, hey, come on, let's go. Let's go to the store and let's go shopping. Let's go hang out in the park and get some fresh air. Let's go, these people's lawn needs some work. Let's go get it mowed and and trimmed up. I don't feel like it. I know you don't feel like it. Just trust me and let's go, let's go try it, right? Just, Just get going. A teammate can help bring some structure, some routine, can help you. I mean, when you're really low, it's hard to even begin to think about what you need to do in a day. And somebody can come alongside and say, let's make this really simple. Can we just get three simple things, three simple goals for a day and work on those? You know, I mean, none of us want to be in a place like that, but it happens. It happens to us, doesn't it? And somebody can come alongside and help. And of all the things you could help a despairing person resume doing, nothing is more important than getting back to loving and serving others, even when you don't feel like it. A teammate can help a depressed person start to take little practical steps of loving service for others. And man, that can change. So many people have talked about the change in their life when they got back out of themselves and involved in the lives of other people and how much that helped. But a lot of times you just, you just feel so terrible, you can't even imagine doing that. And you need somebody to take you by the arm and say, okay, come on, let's try this. Let's go do it. Of course, you can also read scripture to your sorrowing friend. Sometimes we know, we know we need God's word, but we just feel like we can't do it. Our thinking is so foggy or our hearts are so heavy that we just can't do it. You can't get through a verse without your mind running a hundred places. You have no idea what you just read. And and that's frustrating, right? Like, you know it's happening, but you can't get out of it. Like, mind, settle down. (laughs) I'm trying to read here. And so if you're teaming up with a despairing person, just choose a few verses and see if they might let you read. And even if they say no, try again a little while later. Every day's different, every hour's different, try again a little while later. Keep it short, keep it simple, but keep at it. The Psalms can be especially helpful. Welch in his book has two different chapters that are really helpful in talking about how to use the Psalms as a liturgy in our despair. I mean, when we can't figure out how to voice our heartaches to God, God gave us words. That's an amazing thing about the Psalms. God says here, your heart's broken and you can't figure out what to say about it. How about saying this? Here are some words to pray to me to express your sorrow. So that is a beautiful thing and the Psalms can be very, very helpful. In the hospital, I sometimes see a family member sitting on the edge of the bed with a patient, holding the spoon, trying to get them to take bites. The patient's nauseous, has no appetite, wants no food, but that food is necessary if that patient's going to get any stronger and start to get better. And so there's a family member, kindly, patiently, but persistently waiting with the spoon, looking for the opportunity to put in a bite. And, and sometimes that's just what we need spiritually. We need a little spiritual force feeding from a kind, gentle, patient person who's got really small bites of God's truth But they're also persistent. And man, if we crack those lips a quarter of an inch, it's going in. Sometimes we also need someone else who won't let us give up hope. In depression, there is a tendency to want to kill hope. Because you think, if I put my hopes in anything else, I'm just going to get disappointed again. And so I'm not going to. I'm going to stop hoping. And when you stop hoping in anything future, you also cannot enjoy anything in the present because what if you lose that? And so you both have no hope for the future and no enjoyment of the present. And Welch says, you're like the walking dead. Your life has no enjoyment, no hope you, when, you, when you kill hope like that. It just feels too risky though. 
Your heart's been broken. You've been so disappointed. You prayed for so long. But as followers of Jesus, God calls us to both present enjoyment and future hope. God calls us to both of those things. And so you need a teammate who won't let you give up hope. They're going to speak up with the voice of God's truth, and they're going to plead with you to continue to look to God in hope. Now, I'm I'm building here. There's a progression here in what I'm saying. Sometimes a teammate then is going to have to actually be confrontational. We see that right here in Job 6.14. You need a kind friend so that you don't forsake the fear of the Almighty. Wrong thinking can lead us to despair, and we need the renewing of our mind. Sometimes we get stuck in mental mayhem, or what I've heard some people call stinking thinking. And we really need other people to speak truth into our stinking thinking. As much as we hate to be corrected, we need a friend who's on our team to say, you know, I don't think you're seeing that clearly. I don't, I don't think that's completely true, or I don't think you're interpreting that, or that's not the only thing that could mean. And we're going to talk much more about that next week. I've got to not get off on that. But for now, we're just noting that sorrowing and despairing people do need to have the wrong thinking confronted. You, you can get so much in love mode and kindness mode and help mode, that's, which is great, but at some point, you're also going to have to have courage to say, okay, wait a second. I know you've said that to me a lot of times, but can we talk through that? Is that really really what's going on? Is that really true? Okay. So I I hope maybe that was helpful. I'm just trying to talk through the, the great value of a kind friend who comes alongside as a teammate for a sorrowing or despairing person. And I hope that even as I've talked through that, it might be sparking some courage in some of you and maybe also give you a little bit of a sense of direction and knowing how to help. So let me talk more about those two things. Courage and direction. Suppose someone in church comes to you and expresses sorrow upon sorrow. They are low and they are despairing and they don't see much reason to keep going. And even if you're willing to help, where do you start? You know, what what direction do you go with him or her? And I hope from what we've seen this morning you can see that you start first by just trying to be there. First job is just be there. Join the despairing person on her path. Not that you join in her despair, and that's really important, that you not take upon you all of the way they're thinking about everything and all the way they're interpreting everything, and pretty soon you're thinking that you're, you have joined their stinking thinking. You don't want to do that but you do want to join that person on their path and begin a long walk together doing the things that we've described this morning. And that means that you start with a real carefulness about jumping to any quick conclusions about what might be wrong with her. Again, like I said earlier this morning, we like quick conclusions, we like quick answers. We especially like to be the people with the quick solution. But boy, there's a proverb that warns us Proverbs 18, 13, he who gives an answer before he hears, it is folly and shame to him. Quickly jumping to conclusions is no virtue. And it is rarely helpful for people struggling with deep despair to have someone step in and say, I know what your problem is, let's fix it. That is just rarely helpful. It's better to be very careful about dogmatic explanations for why they're despairing. It's better to be very cautious about the one answer that explains it all. Better to just start with the mindset that this is a long path and I'm going to be with you and we're just going to patiently seek the Lord together. Think of a football coach whose team loses the first five games of the season. I don't know who that would be right now. Maybe the Jets. All right? And he's determined that he knows what the problem is. Let's say he says the problem is the pace of our offense. We got to get to the line of scrimmage quicker. We got to get that ball snapped. We got to keep the defense from making their substitutions. We got to get a flow and a rhythm. And so every day in practice, that's what they're working on. That's all the players hear about. Pace, 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 pace. And finally, his assistant coaches come to him and say, okay, coach, would you be willing to consider some other things that might be wrong? 
You know, maybe there's more than one factor here. Maybe there's more than one thing we could improve here. And that's the same way we want to think when we're trying to help someone who is deeply despairing. We want to be willing to look into all the possibilities. Let's look into physical factors. I mean, I've experienced this in my own family where something as simple as a, just a vitamin deficiency can make your mood stink. You can feel lousy and have a really low energy level. And the doctor runs a blood test and says, you're way low on, you know, iron or vitamin D or whatever it might be. So let's look into the physical factors. How about the cultural factors? You know, we live in a world that's pressuring us all the time to live a certain way, to have certain things, to live up to certain expectations, to look a certain way. Those things can drive a person crazy. How have those factors been been pressing on you? What about your relationships? What are the big changes and challenges in your relationships over the past month or year? What have been the losses that you've experienced, the broken relationships? And then, of course, what about the spiritual factors? You know, what's been going on in your heart before the Lord? How have you been staying close to Jesus? How have you been obeying or not obeying Him? We're multifaceted human beings, so we want to look at all of our lives. We always want more than one plan of attack for depression. We want to look at all of our lives. Now, I'm not saying that if someone comes to you and says, man, I'm just really sad, I'm just feeling like I don't want to do anything anymore, what, that kind of thing, that you should say, okay, I got a checklist for you. First of all, point one, let's look at, now let's look at, now let's look at, and you got 100 questions for them. That's not what I mean. You get on the journey, you say, okay, we're going to patiently seek the Lord together, and as we go, we're going to try to look at all the options. We're going to, we're going to let God do whatever he wants to do here. We're not just going to try to find the one thing that's going to solve it. Of course, for Christians, the one thing we usually think is, I'm going to figure out the sin that I missed, and I'm going to confess that to the Lord, and that's going to solve it all. And then you think you find the sin, and you confess that to the Lord, and that doesn't solve it all, and then you despair more. Is there something else I missed? And that, that's, a, that's a, rough, a rough thing. We want, we want a, more than one plan of attack. We want to look at the whole scope of our lives. We don't want to say, just get medication, and an antidepressant will help you feel better. Well, there may be a reason to do that at some point, but don't make medication your only plan of attack. What about all the rest of your life? What other things could be fixed and worked on and improved in the, in the, in the, in the course of trying to handle this? Or we could say, well, it's just grief. I had this loss. I had this death in the family. I, I haven't gotten over that yet, and I'm just stuck in the grieving process. Well, that might be part of what's going on. You might be stuck in the grieving process, but is that all that's going on? Maybe there are more factors. Let's, let's let God do whatever he wants to do. You see what I'm saying? Let's get on the path, patiently seek the Lord, and let God do whatever he wants. And what's so exciting is that depression is always an opportunity to grow very deep roots in our relationship with God. Always. Welch says it this way, depression always directs our attention to the most important matters of human life. Who am I? Who is God? What is God doing? What does God say about me? Who am I going to trust? And so even depression can end up giving us significant hope. Romans 5 says that. Suffering produces endurance. Endurance produces character. Character produces hope. Can depression be the road to hope? Yes, absolutely. Can you come out of depression with more hope than you had before? Yes, you can. You can. Can you come out of something like that? And by the way, when I say come out, I don't mean that the goal always has to be to be completely come out. You might struggle for a long time, but I mean, can you make progress through your depression and start to do better and actually have deeper roots in your relationship with God than you had before? Yes! One hymn says, each strand of sorrow has its place within the tapestry of grace. If it is through depression that God really helps us see how we need to draw close to Him and how we need the renewing of our minds and how we need the body of Christ, that is a sweet thing. The dry desert can become a well-watered plain. The morning can be turned into joy. So if you're helping a sorrowing person, patiently and humbly join them on that journey. Don't jump to a quick conclusion about what's wrong. Be willing to gently, patiently help them look into every possibility. Let God do whatever He wants. All right, so I said, for those of you who are caring for a tar- sorrowing person, two things. First, I hope you'll feel some sense of direction like we've just been talking about. And then secondly, I-, I hope you might begin to feel some more courage. Maybe some of your fears and uncertainties lessening a little bit. You know, I hope you might start to say, okay, with the Lord's help, 
I think I can do that. I think I could stick with somebody. I think I can listen. I think I can stay in touch. I think I can open my Bible and find Psalms and read. I think I can share what God's doing in my life. I think I can pray. I think I can do this. But I know that our thinking can become very fearful when we're helping the despairing. We might have the fear that they're going to take their own life. And many of you have been in that situation at some point. And that fear can, here's the irony, that fear can paralyze us from actually helping someone. We hit the panic button and we want to push them off to somebody else. Like, where's the nearest expert to whom I can give this person? And in the process, we might actually not get on the path with them and help them like we could in the middle of our, our, our panic. Now, obviously, if, if someone is talking like that about, to you about not wanting to live, you need to take them seriously. You need to ask questions. That is a time to start asking more questions. And you do, one of the first things I'd recommend you do is you get a couple other people involved right away so that you're not the only person who knows. Get a couple other people involved right away. So I'm not saying that it's not something you should take seriously, but you don't have to panic. It's not actually that uncommon for people to say, I just don't feel like living any longer. Job said it right here. And he's one of several people in the Bible who said it. We're going to look at another one in just a minute. It's not that uncommon because life is full of futility. And we hit points in life where we just say, I don't know if this is worth it anymore. So when someone says that, you, you don't have to scream and yell and panic and, and uh, not that you do that. I'm over-exaggerating. But what I'm trying to help you see is just that, yeah, listen carefully, ask questions, get some other people involved. But jump into the person's life. Get on their path with them. Don't, don't get scared away. Take courage that God can use you. Another fear we might have is that if it's something medical, then it's way out of our league. And again, I would just say, Remember that we want to look into every possibility. So first of all, you may want to encourage them to go see a doctor and go with them if you can. You know, that's great. That's important. There are many physical factors that affect our minds and emotions, but that doesn't shut you out of the process. If they're taking, for example, if they're taking psychiatric medications, that doesn't mean that you don't have a role. They still need teammates just like you because medical tools might help how you feel, but they can't give you hope right? They might be able to help your body feel better so that you can think clearly enough to think about what the hope is. But chemicals can't give you hope. You need God and you need some teammates in your life speaking truth to give you hope. You see what I mean? So even if you say, there's, boy, I think there's some medical stuff going on here and we need to get them to the doctor, great, get them to the doctor and you get on their path with them, right? We might have the fear that there's spiritual warfare going on. And once again, we might think, man, I'm way out of my league here. But again, that's not true. First of all, you live in spiritual warfare all the time, folks. Do you think Satan just leaves you alone? That he doesn't throw his fiery darts at you? I mean, your daily battle for truth and right thinking and prayer and walking with the Lord, you know what spiritual warfare is like. You live in it. So so you don't have to think that I don't know anything about that. I don't know how to help a person with that. But second of all, even if that is happening in a severe way in someone's life, what's the most important weapon we have in spiritual warfare? It's truth. Satan is the father of lies. He's the father of stinking thinking. And so when you step into a situation with truth, you've got the most powerful weapon there is by the Spirit of God. So you don't have to feel like it's out of your league and there's nothing you can do to help. All right, so I just hope you'll feel a sense of encouragement that as a child of God, with the compassion of Christ, with the Spirit in you, armed with His truth, you can make a difference, even in the life of someone who is deeply despairing. All right, I want us to finish up this morning with a reminder from Elijah's despair. Will you go with me to 1 Kings 19? This will be a familiar passage for some of you but I think we might find some fresh wisdom here in the light of our current study. But, and for some of you, this story will be new and I think probably exciting to see this morning, to see another Bible description of someone who was so low. 1 Kings 19. And what we're going to see here is we're going to get a glimpse into God's own ministry to a despairing person. The person is Elijah, and Elijah was at this point alone with no one else to care for him. 
He was ready to die, and God directly cared for him. So let's just watch. Wouldn't you like to watch God care for a despairing person? Here you go. 1 Kings 19, verses 1 through 4. Now, Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, So may the gods do to me and even more. If I do not make your life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. In other words, Elijah, you're dead. Verse 3, And he was afraid, and arose, and ran for his life, and came to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness, and came and sat down under a juniper tree, and he requested for himself that he might die, and said, It is enough. Now, Yahweh, take my life, for I am not better than my father's. All right, so this story begins, I, I, I can't go back and recount everything that happened before this point, but it begins with some very intense circumstances. Elijah has someone promising to kill him, so there's real danger to his life. And often our despair involves some real circumstances in our lives that are really difficult. We don't just imagine our troubles completely. We have real troubles, real pressure. But then, notice in verse 3, he left his servant behind. Now, I don't know what his motives were in that, but what's most likely is that he did what most of us tend to do, and that is isolate ourselves when we're despairing, which is the last thing we want to do when we're despairing. He leaves his servant behind and takes off all by himself into the desert. And then we get a glimpse into what he's thinking in verse 4. He says... Well, he requests that he might die. And he says, it is enough, right? What do we say today? I can't take it anymore. I've had enough. I'm done. Don't try to tell me about hope. I'm done. And those are very familiar words for anyone in despair. So it's enough. Now, Yahweh, take my life. Okay, he's not thinking about taking his own life apparently, but he sure wishes God would just take it and get it over with. And then he says, I'm not better than my father's. And that, that could mean several different things, but I wonder if that's not similar to the common refrain, no one will miss me anyways. It's not going to matter if I'm gone. He had genuinely troubling circumstances, but as his mind interpreted those things, he quickly got off track. And this is what we do. I'm going to come back to this next Sunday. We experience genuinely hard things, but then we start to think incorrectly about those things, and it leads us to despair. But the great news here is that Elijah's being honest with God. Are these words faithless, or is this faith? Hmm? What is it when you come to God and you say, God, here's how I'm really feeling, and here's how I'm really thinking? That is faith. The very fact that you came to God with it means it is faith. That's what's beautiful here. He brings this to God. He brings his despair, even though he's not thinking clearly about it. Now, what does God do? Read verses five through nine. Elijah lay down and slept under a juniper tree. Notice God didn't answer him yet. He goes to sleep without an answer from God. He lay down and slept under a juniper tree. And behold, there was an angel touching him. And he said to him, arise, eat. Then he looked and behold, there was at his had a bread cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water. So he ate and drank and lay down again. The angel of the Lord came again a second time and touched him and said, Arise, eat, because the journey is too great for you. So he arose and ate and drank and went in the strength of that food 40 days and 40 nights to Horeb, the mountain of God. Then he came there to a cave and lodged there. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him and he said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? All right. Pause right there. So first of all, note that before God says anything to him, God lets him sleep and God gets him food. And as much as we hate to admit it, sometimes sleep and a good meal can affect our mood a lot more than we want to admit, right? Sometimes we need to help a, restoring, a, a despairing person start to restore some order to his schedule, to his eating, to his sleeping, to his nutrition. I mean, you sleep a couple hours here and a couple hours there and live on Twinkies and you'll feel lousy too. And I'm, I'm not trying to make light of that. That's what happens to us when we don't feel, we, we, we just kind of operate on how we feel and I, I feel like sugar and I feel like not sleeping and I feel like watching this movie and all of a sudden life's all 
out of order. And so God prescribes some physical answers first, so that Elijah will have the strength for some spiritual answers. Remember, we go after depression with a multifaceted attack. That's what God does here. Then God starts to help Elijah through his wrong thinking. Verse 9, what are you doing here, Elijah? In other words, Elijah, tell me what you're thinking. Tell me what you're thinking. And, and please do this. If you're trying to help a despairing person, you're going to have to listen a lot, and it's not going to be fun to find out what they're thinking. God knows what Elijah's thinking, but he still wants Elijah to have to think it through and verbalize. Why am I here? What am I doing right now? Then verse 10, Elijah said, well, I've been very zealous for Yahweh, the God of hosts, for the sons of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword, and I alone am left, and they're seeking my life to take it away. Is there truth in what Elijah just said? Is there truth there? Yeah, there's quite a bit of truth there. There's some real facts. Is there some untruth there? Yeah. There's one big false conclusion he's reached, and that's I'm the only one left, and that's a very common conclusion in despair in one way or another. I'm the only one who's gone through this or who understands or whatever. Um, but then, I think he doesn't say it directly, but isn't he seem to be suggesting that God's kind of failed him? God isn't caring for him. God's failing Israel. God's letting it all get out of hand. And that's, that's stinking thinking about God. Now, we don't have time to read the whole rest of the passage. I hope you'll do that on your own. But after Elijah says this to God, the first thing God does is give Elijah a little display of his majesty, or a big display of his majesty, I guess you could say. When we are despairing, things like sleep and food might be a good start, but there's nothing we need more than the majesty of God to grab our attention again. And then after the display of his majesty, God sent Elijah on a mission. Verse 15, Yahweh said to him, what's the first word? Go. (laughs) Come on, Elijah, go. Go. Go, return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus, and when you have arrived, you'll anoint Hazael king over Aram. And Jehu, the son of Nimshi, you'll anoint king over Israel. And Elisha, the son of Shaphat of abel Mahola, you shall anoint as prophet in your place. It shall come about, the one who escapes from the sword of Hazael, Jehu will put him to death. And the one who escapes from the sword of Jehu, Elisha will put him to death. Yet I'm going to leave 7,000 in Israel, all the knees that have not bowed to Baal and every mouth that has not kissed him. So uh, go first. Like we said, when we're despairing, we need other people to get us busy again serving the Lord. And then God you know, tells Elijah, uh, you're, there's 7,000 that I'm going to hold on to that are still going to be loyal to me. And then Elisha shows up here. God gives Elijah help. See verse 21, the end of verse 21. Then he, that's Elisha, arose and followed Elijah and ministered to him. I love that. God sent Elijah a teammate to be with him on his path after he left his servant behind. A teammate to be with him on his path to minister to him. So you see what God did? Sleep and food, confront and correct his thinking, show him God's majesty, get him to work serving the Lord, and give him a teammate to minister to him on his path. And that last point is just what this message is calling each of us to be willing to do this morning. When God brings a despairing person across your path, Will you be willing to do just what verse 21 describes and arise and follow them and minister to them? Willing to go with that person on his path, join him on his journey, though not in his despair, and minister to him. That is a sweet, sweet way to serve our beloved Jesus because he keeps on ministering to us just like that.